Hello, my name is Alex Murray, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program, presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you about today's program. Please let us know your feedback by contacting us on social media or via email at doleinstitute at ku.edu. To view past programs, visit our online video archive at www.doleinstitute.org. A video of today's presentation will be available on our website soon. We'd like to encourage each of you to consider becoming friends of the Dole Institute. Our friends help keep the programs free and open and support archive research and our student activities. Please contact us if you're interested. After the presentation, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker will come around with a microphone. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now, please welcome and please welcome me, please join me in welcoming, excuse me, Dr. Tom Hansen. Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and happy new year. Uh, welcome to the 2018 season of the Fort Leavenworth. Uh, History for the Military Mind lecture series. And we're going to deviate a little bit from past topics, a um, little less bugles and drums and a little bit more uh, esoteric stuff. We're going to talk not just about war fronts, but home fronts. And today's lecture uh, is a, a great example of that. We're going to talk about life in Great Britain during the Napoleonic Wars, but not on the battlefield, but back inside England. Uh, it, it's a fascinating topic. I think everybody here is going to enjoy it. Our presenter today is Dr. Mark Gerges. He is a uh, veteran of the Department of Military History. Uh, he's been here for, what, 12 years? No, longer than that. Yeah, much longer than that, sorry. Said, well, it's also Mark's birthday today, but I'm trying not to make people think that he's old, so I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to compress everything. He's, you're what, uh, 2019 today? Yeah. Anyway, Mark is, you read his biograph or his biography in the, the handout. He is a graduate of the other U.S. Military Academy, the one north of West Point. Uh, he is an armor officer. He's a veteran of Operation Desert Storm. Uh, but more importantly, he is a graduate of that Napoleonic Center of Excellence, the Florida State University. And he is currently working on uh, a book on cavalry operations under Wellington in the peninsula, for which he just spent two weeks in the UK last summer, so I expect to see great things coming from him shortly. Uh, so, even if you don't like the presentation, make sure you applaud loudly because it is his birthday. Make him feel good, okay? So, please, welcome Dr. Mark Gerges. Makes me sound really desperate to get a good uh, audience uh, reaction. Now, I have to admit, as we start this today, I'm a little conflicted with this particular topic. My area is the British Cavalry under uh, Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. I work on uh, British Cavalry operations in Portugal and Spain. Um, and so my, most of my focus is on the British Army, British government, um, um, and the political um, interactions with keeping an army fielded, the organization and doctrine. At the same time, I'm a graduate of Florida State University, and uh, there we have the Institute of Napoleon and the French Revolution. So. Um, I get, got everything from a French perspective. And so even the title of the ogre um, kind of puts a little chills down my back. And uh, so we're going to talk about this uh, today. And hopefully, um, as we go through this, I'm going to have you change a little bit of your opinion of how you look at this, uh, this particular era. And when you think of the United Kingdom, and before I get started, I'm going to go back and forth between using United Kingdom, Great Britain, Britain, and England. Uh, pretty much interchangeably. Uh, 
1801, the United Ki it becomes the United Kingdom, uh, Great Britain and Ireland. Um, but really, we're talking about Britain and Great Britain for the most uh, of this and the, uh, the invasion threat of that. Uh, but I'll be a little bit loose of the terms as we go. But when you look at uh, the United Kingdom post-1815 and post-Waterloo, uh, the view is what you see up here. Uh, Napoleon on the HMS Belferon, um, after he has surrendered himself to his dear cousin, um, Prince Regent, Prince of Wales, um, trying to look for asylum before he's going to be uh, sent off to St. Helena and to his final exile. Uh, the great uh, Duke of Wellington, uh, at this point the hero of Europe, and um, the view that comes out that's cemented after 1815 is that Britain is this indispensable nation who has stayed like a rock, constant against uh, France and this domineering despot and has really had this continuity of purpose uh, over a 25 year time period uh, that has allowed them to save Europe and bring it back uh, from the, uh, the, the edge of what Napoleon threats, threatens. Um, I'm gonna kind of talk about a couple of different areas here though. Um, one is gonna be this political instability, uh, instability that you're gonna see, that there is not this continuity of what they're trying to do against uh, Napoleon also, this idea that once the Battle of Trafalgar takes place in 1805, that there is no threat from Napoleon to invade Europe, uh, or invade uh, Great Britain, which really isn't um, that true. Um, and also, uh, just uh, talking about some of the ec economic challenges. As Great Britain is fighting against Napoleon, it's also the start of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the commerce has been broken down, there's going to be inflation, rising food prices, uh, economic uh, dislocation because of labor-saving machines. And so we'll talk about all those things. Uh, two myths I'm going to address kind of directly on here is one is this idea that Britain has had a constant policy against uh, Napoleon uh, that makes them the great, um, uh, the great savior of Europe. And the second one is this idea of a French invasion ends after October of 1805. So um, let's go back for a little bit and talk about uh, Georgian England um, and during the uh, French Revolution. And for Napoleonic uh, scholars, we tend to break down this period into two blocks, the French Revolution from 1789 up to uh, 1799 uh, with the coup of 18th Brumaire when Napoleon becomes uh, the first consul, and then from uh, uh, 1799 to 1815 is the Napoleonic era. So we're talking about that first piece uh, when um, the French Revolution starts, and when it starts, Britain is really kind of torn in many ways. The first three years of the French Revolution um, is not the violent revolution that we tend to think about with guillotine showing up on every street corner. Um, it is an attempt to create a constitutional monarchy with a king, uh, with a parliament, and a series of checks and balances. And as Britain um, looks at this, they think it's kind of reflecting back to their own glorious re uh, revolution. Um, they look at this as a good, uh, good thing. It's only as the revolution starts to become more and more violent uh, over time that it becomes more and more of a threat to them. The second issue that comes back is this relationship between George III uh, and his son, the future George IV. Um, the Hanoverian kings, uh, the four Georges, tend to have this um, terrible, terrible father-son relationship where they almost hate um, uh, each other and treat, them so, uh, treat their, their children very, very badly. Um, and then also the concerns of uh, George III's mental state. He'll have a series of uh, increasing mental uh, breakdowns that'll finally lead to a regent being app appointed later in this time period. Um, George III, uh, Farmer George is his nickname, uh, has been the King of England since uh, uh, 1760. Uh, very frugal, uh, loves agriculture and new agricultural um, uh, investments and his uh, very, very frugal and, and, and down-to-earth type of uh, lifestyle. He's unique for the, the Hanoverians in that he doesn't have a mistress. He's married to his, his wife and, and uh, devoted to her, has 15 children, but he's very, very strict uh, on his children, uh, particularly the Prince of Wales, the future king. And so when the future king uh, turns 18, uh, he's going to revolt around, uh, or he's really going to revolt against this very, very frugal lifestyle. Um, and he also has about 40 years he has to wait to become king. So he is constantly going to be out there um, 
part of it just, just, just despite his dad. He's going to be a glutton. He uh, has a res uh, refined taste. Um, he has a 55,000 pound a year um, uh, allowance that he, ha uh, that he gets. Um, and by 1795, he is 550,000 pounds in debt above that allowance. So he likes to spend. He likes to, um, uh, to really live the good life. And he also, as you look at these, uh, these two men, the, um, the oppositions tend to, to uh, co coalesce around him. Uh, William Pitt, uh, Pitt the Younger, uh, England's youngest prime minister, takes over at age 24 uh, in 1783, um, is going to serve uh, George III. Uh, so he is really supporting that, uh, that royal background, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the con uh, conservative piece of, uh, of George III, where uh, James Fox is going to um, uh, kind of start to, to work in the orbit of, uh, of the Prince of Wales. And he's looked at as a bad influence. He's not a, uh, many people consider him a poor character. Um, he is, uh, a, he's anti-slavery. Uh, he's also pro-French Revolution. Um, and it, these two guys are going to be kind of in opposition of each other for about 20 years um, as the big uh, drivers of the British uh, government. And of course, the French Revolution is that key thing in the 1790s that they are going to be focused on and, and most of the discussion. And the question is, after 1793, is how can Britain uh, get involved uh, in the Napoleonic Wars? Um, they're going to try to be part of coalitions. Uh, the first coalition they get involved in in 1793 won't work so well. Uh, by, uh, you can see uh, by 1797, they're the only country left in that coalition. They'll have one campaign where they'll put troops into the Low Countries under the Duke of York, the, uh, the, the brother of the king, uh, and it'll be an absolute disaster. Uh, we get a nursery rhyme about the, the noble Duke of York marching his men up the hill again and back down. Um, but they're the only ones left in the, co uh, the uh, coalition. They'll come back, and there'll be a second coalition that'll uh, come out in 1798, again, to, uh, to f confront the French. And again, um, Britain is going to be the only country left by 1801, and you see their campaigns really ineffective of what they are trying to, uh, to get um, uh, and confront this threat of the French, uh, as they're going to see. The, Fr the British actions actually hurt their own cause in many ways. They are so uh, concerned about neutral shipping and what's being shipped to France that they will be boarding neutral ships. It will force um, uh, Sweden, Russia, uh, Prussia to form a, ar a league of armed neutrality. It's a similar thing that happened during the American Revolution, where these neutral countries will band together uh, to keep Britain from um, interfering with neutral uh, shipping. Um, and this will drive Russia out of the second coalition. There's also going to be naval mutinies. We think of England's, uh, the Royal Navy, as this rock that uh, defends uh, Great Britain. Uh, but there will be a naval mutinies uh, at the Spithead and the Nore. And uh, these mutinies have two different causes. The, the one at Spithead is much more about the conditions on board the ships, uh, long periods of time without shore leave, very, very poor provisions, uh, very, very harsh punishments. And that mutiny will really address those type of issues. The one at the Nore, though, becomes much more uh, political in overtone. Uh, it's looking at um, things like um, the, well, it's going to ask the king to dissolve parliament and uh, make peace with France. And so these are very, very concerning, and Britain's going to have to put some effort um, into uh, reforming their navy, and particularly how they uh, pay and, and, uh, and discipline the troops and how they, uh, they victual them uh, on board. I don't want to go into all the British ministries here. The one piece you should take away from this is that in the 12 years of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, there's going to be six different prime ministers. It's very, very hard to have any sort of continuity. Um, you will see prime ministers like Henry Addington, uh, who's going to be here, who negotiates the peace, uh, the uh, Treaty of Amiens, who will then, um, after war starts again, lose his support because he's allowed them to go back to war. Um, William Pitt will come back for a very, very short time. Um, you'll also have uh, other peace uh, negotiations that go out back, but this is a constant over uh, looking back and forth of, uh, of changing of the prime ministers. And there's really not these, these coalesced parties um, that you would see um, in, in Britain. So it's much more of a, uh, personalities around certain people. 
that you get. So peace finally comes. After 10 years of war, the Treaty of Amens is supposed to establish peace, friendship, and understanding. Uh, it releases prisoners and hostages, and it starts this large-scale transfer of, of lands that have been captured throughout the war going back um, to, um, uh, to each side. Uh, you can see the list of all those, uh, uh, those different things. I should point out that Lord Cornwallis and uh, Joseph Bonaparte are the two negotiators there in the center uh, who will sign this. And for Britain and for France, this treaty uh, is a good thing. For, for 10 years, no one has been on the continent. They have not had the opportunity to, uh, to really see what's been going on. If you also think about just the dislocation in France itself, um, where you have large households uh, with aristocrats. Um, society has changed. Much of that aristocratic, just the servants you need to keep that household, the porcelain, the high-end luxury items uh, that are produced, the chefs, all those things um, have changed and, and gone away. And so as the treaty of the peace comes, it, there's going to be a huge influx of British tourists uh, into France uh, that are there to basically see what's happened uh, in the 10 years since they've been able to, uh, uh, to go. So this is uh, James Gilray, and I, I should have pointed out there's a lot of Gilray, there's a lot of political cartoons in this time period, 1780s to the 1830s, really a heyday of these, uh, these cartoons, and they're fantastic. Uh, they're very, very biting and satire, sat, uh, full of satire, but um, this particular one of uh, Napoleon kissing Britannia after 10 years um, so war is going to come back. 14 months of peace. A um, lot of causes. Uh, one historian is going to say that it was a mixture of economic motives and national neuroses, an irrational anxiety about Napoleon's motives and intentions. The trading of the lands, going back to the various uh, pieces are going on, that at the same time Napoleon is reorganizing Europe and not covered in the Treaty of Amiens. Um, the Helvetian Republic, which is going to be Switzerland, um, is going to be one of the issues. Um, but the real issue for Great Britain is that George III, from the House of Hanover, is an elector of the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, he is being locked out of any sort of say, uh, say in Europe itself. Um, and I should have mentioned here, for a French historian coming into this, it's, it's funny to read some of the comments because um, you're going to read some things like, you know, Britain pushed beyond its limit of endurance will declare war in France. Well, it's not because they're pushed behind, because it makes perfect sense for them uh, to go back to war. And they didn't want to evacuate some of the lands that they had. So war comes again. Uh, mostly uh, both sides are going to go on it. But Britain declares war, uh, begins attacking and seizing British and Dutch ships uh, in the Channel. Napoleon retaliates by uh, not allowing British tourists out of France. Uh, interestingly enough, this is not uh, the 20th century. When he says you can't leave France, you just can't leave France. You're not put into any kind of camp. You just get to the border. There's no, uh, no paper allowing you to leave, and so you just stay in France um, and, and go about your business, but um, you're not uh, put into a camp of any sort. The view of Napoleon. Um, this is that, uh, a, a fantastic nursery rhyme. I, don't, I wish I had it when my children were little, uh, small. Baby, baby, naughty baby. Hush, you squalling thing, I say. Hush, you squalling, or it may be, Bonaparte will pass this way. Baby, baby, he's a giant, tall and black as grand steeple. And he dines and sups, rely on it, every day on naughty people. Baby, baby, he will tear you as he passes by the house. And he, limb from limb, will tear you as a pussy tears a mouse. I think that'll keep him quiet for a while. Um, but this idea that Napoleon's the, an ogre, uh, Betsy Balcom, who is a, uh, as a young girl on St. Helena, uh, will befriend Napoleon and keeps a journal uh, of this, will say that um, the earliest idea I had of Napoleon was that of a huge ogre or giant with one large flaming red eye in the middle of his forehead and long teeth protruding from his mouth with which he tore to pieces and devoured little, naughty little girls especially those who did not know their lessons. So, what does Britain have to rely on? Of course, the first bedrock is the Royal Navy. Uh, 103 ships to the line. They're versions of battleships, the largest um, guns battleships, and about 160 frigates. And you see Lord Vincent's comment there is, I'm not saying the French won't come, but they're just not going to come by sea. 
Which, of course, is one of those sayings, if you're the first city lord, uh, or if you're the first lord of the admiralty, you have to say something like that. Uh, and we're going to talk about Napoleon's plan and a little bit about whether it was possible that uh, Napoleon could have come uh, by sea. I already mentioned a little bit of some of the problems they had had just five years earlier uh, with some of the, um, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the mutinies. Um, and there's four fleets, uh, four commands that are going to defend uh, England. What are they defending against? Well, Napoleon has created six camps along the English co uh, coast um, with a center main camp at Bologna. And this has become known as the uh, camps of Bologna. There's about 93,000 French soldiers up there. Uh, of these six camps, each one of them will become what's known as a corps, uh, court armé. Uh, when, when Napoleon creates this grand army, each one of these will become uh, one of his corps. And he also starts uh, shipwrights working on flat bottom bar barges, 35 ton barges that can be rowed across the, uh, uh, the English Channel. Uh, they can hold 151,000 men, uh, but there's only 93,000. And so some historians dismiss that, saying this isn't really a credible threat. There was really no intention for him to ever do it because he never moved the troops up there. A couple of pieces, though. Uh, one, he spends almost 20 million francs on improving the roads between Paris and his various, uh, his various ports. Um, this is, despite the fact that the roads he actually uses when he goes to attack Austria and Russia, he spent zero dollars on, or zero francs on. He's put all his money into trying to move tra uh, troops uh, up to the Channel Coast. This is what Britain fears. And you can see from these, uh, some of these cartoons, they're pretty elaborate fears. That central portion here that's not in color shows a few things. One, it shows balloons. Uh, holding troops that are going to float across the, uh, the channel. In the center, you see the barges. They're going to come move the ma mass, uh, uh, mass of the army. And then the last part, which I particularly find uh, interesting, is the channel, the channel, a tunnel under the channel that is going to be moving the horses and artillery. Um, supposedly, Nor uh, Na Napoleon has asked for an engineering study about doing a, a tunnel underneath it, uh, the channel. Uh, that's as far as it gets. Um, the French army does have balloons that they're going to use in the 1790s, but Napoleon really doesn't put much effort into that. Um, and you see Britain's reactions. One is, of course, the bombastic, within 48 hours, we're going to have his head on a pike. The other one is going to be in the 1790s when there was another invasion threat, uh, showing the French army running around uh, in England, creating absolute mayhem. And so, as they look at this, th there's this, this palpable sense of fear uh, that is going on. Napoleon's plan um, relies on a lot of moving parts and uh, a lot of things he can't control, mostly uh, the weather. Uh, but what he's going to have is the French fleet in Toulon under an Admiral Villeneuve who is going to leave uh, his, the Mediterranean port, go out to Cadiz in Spain, pick up the Spanish fleet. Uh, Spain and France are uh, allied at this time. And at that point, race across uh, the Atlantic uh, going into the uh, Sugar Islands in the Caribbean. Um, this first portion of the plan works perfectly. Uh, Villeneuve comes out. Uh, he gives the slip to uh, Lord Nelson, uh, the famous uh, admiral who will die uh, at, at Talf uh, Traf uh, Trafalgar. And uh, Nelson will go racing towards Egypt, thinking that the French are trying to land in Egypt. And he ac they actually go the wrong way. Villeneuve and the Spanish will then sail to the, uh, the West Indies, uh, stay there for a few weeks, and then sail back across the Atlantic. Up to this point, the plan's gone perfectly, but Villeneuve will think he's been spotted, he thinks there's a British fleet nearby, and will head south instead of north. Um, the plan is he's supposed to pick up the Brest fleet and the 20-some ships there, uh, go around Ireland, around Scotland, and then come into the channel uh, from the east. They are going to stop at Texel Island, pick up the 10 Dutch uh, uh, ships of the line there. And then with approximately 44 ships compared to the Channel uh, Fleet, uh, Admiral Keith's fleet of 11 ships, win control over the Channel for a couple of days. And that's all Napoleon says he needs. He needs six tides, three days to be able to move his troops uh, across the Channel. When they get to Texel Island outside of Amsterdam, there's a semaphore system that goes all the way to Paris. Um, they're supposed to signal that they're there. Uh, it's approximately 300 miles by sea. 
uh, from Amsterdam to uh, Bologna. It takes about three days to get there. By the time they would get there, the troops that had been alerted based off the semaphore message would already be arranged, uh, arriving at the channel. And so that 153,000 troops that Nap Napoleon had built the barges would would be available uh, there to, uh, to, to be moved across the channel. And then that combined fleet would go in there. What actually happens is Villeneuve loses his, uh, his nerve, heads south to Cadiz, um, will stay there until October, and then the 21st of October will try to come out again um, and will be uh, defeated at Trafalgar. Um, I mentioned about liking to read sometimes the British uh, uh, pieces uh, about this. Um, when I was looking at this, the BBC had a history site talking about the, uh, the Battle of Trafalgar. And uh, one of the things they said was, it seems likely that, likely that the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte had already abandoned his plans for invasion of England, but the victory nevertheless handed Britain complete control of the seas. Yes, he had, com he had definitely abandoned uh, his uh, invasion because he was two months into a campaign against Austria. He had already defeated the Austrian army of uh, Mack at Ulm and was marching towards Vienna. Uh, so he was several hundred miles from the sea. So I'm pretty certain that before Trafalgar, he had already given up uh, the plans. Um, the campaign obviously does not go uh, Britain's way. Uh, Austria and Russia at Austerlitz will be absolutely defeated and will leave uh, the coalition. Uh, and only Trafalgar on the 21st of, uh, of, of October will be looked at as a real victory. It is an amazing uh, naval battle, 33 uh, French ships of the line versus 27 British. Um, the French and Spanish will lose 22, and the British will lose none. Um, so it's an absolutely devastating loss. Um, it leaves France with 35 line of battleships. Now, uh, let's shift a little bit to the land defenses um, of this time period. And between 1803 and about 1807, there's a real threat um, that if the French would come, the defenses would not be uh, ready. Britain has four different organizations defending um, the home. The first is the regular army. Uh, and the regular army has um, approximately 132,000 men at this time. But when you break it down, um, 18,000 of them are in Ireland. Um, 50,000 are in Great Britain. And the rest are overseas uh, defending the various colonies. The second aspect they have are, is the militia forces, which uh, they originally start off with 51,000, and the second uh, militia act reaches up to 75,000. Volunteers, uh, and I should mention, the regular army is under the commander in chief, the Duke of York. The uh, militia forces are under the Lord Lieutenants of the counties, so they have two different commanders uh, and would have to co cooperate, but not under a single command. Volunteers, um, they are infantry and uh, what they call yeoman cavalry, but there is no set organization. Um, for example, the cavalry, depending on how big the cavalry is, depends on how many people come with their own horses. Uh, to make up the yeoman uh, cavalry. Um, 480,000 looks very, very impressive until you realize that Britain just doesn't have that many firearms laying around waiting to arm people. And so 103,000 of them are armed by pikes. Um, and they have really no training. Um, that draw, the cartoon there kind of shows the regular army's view of the, uh, you can see the regular army officer and uh, the you know, militia man or the volunteer uh, trying to drill. The last aspe aspect that's, that's actually working al also is this Ordnance Corps, uh, not under the Commander-in-Chief. It has the artillery, the Royal Artillery, the Royal Artillery drivers, and also uh, the Royal Engineers. And that's important because they do permanent fortifications. So castles, uh, masonry forts are under the Ordnance Corps, but the regular army and the commander in chief does field fortifications. So you have two different organizations trying to defend, build uh, fortifications. The answer that one of the, th the answers that uh, they're going to come up with is this idea that they call martello towers. These are big masonry towers that are going to be placed every five to six hundred yards along the coast uh, in Sussex and Kent to be able to fire onto the invasion beaches. The idea is first proposed in 1803, but the Ordnance Corps is not very interested in it. It's only going to be in 1804 when the uh, commander in chief of the army will say, you know, if you're too busy, I can build these, uh, that the Ordnance Corps will then become uh, interested in it. But it's as late as September 1804 before they actually build, uh, get a design for.
for the Martello, Martello Towers. Um, and what you're seeing in this, in this one painting here, or drawing, is the Martello Towers along the beaches. Um, 73 originally, then they're going to grow up to 103 once they start putting them on the, uh, the Channel Islands. Each one's supposed to have a 24-inch uh, naval gun on it, and then two cannonades, which are a short, um, heavy, heavy um, artillery piece uh, used on board ship. Uh, they're called smashers. They're meant to throw large amounts of, of uh, uh, ordnance uh, at enemy ships. And so they're going to put three guns uh, in these Martello Towers. Um, five foot thick walls with a five foot thick brick uh, center to hold the, uh, the guns up and 33 foot tall. Um, someone had done the calculations. Each of those big 24 inch guns, uh, they have two different types of shot, a heavy shot and a light shot. The heavy shot carries 84 of these six ounce balls, so about this big, uh, that they could fire. The light shot, not because they're light in itself, but it's because it only fires two inch or two ounce balls, but it has 232. So basically, every round this fires is about an infantry company's worth of firepower, uh, and they are meant to overlap uh, on the beaches. Um, and the last part is this area called the Romney Marsh. It's that part of uh, Sussex that sticks out into the channel. Because of the way the weather and, and the tides, it can be landed on almost in any weather condition. Um, the beaches are very good for landing, but then there's a marsh behind it. It is below sea level, so they can be flooded by opening up uh, the sluices to let the, uh, the tides in, but it takes three different, or three days, six tides to be able to flood it again. And so the fear is, is that if the French land on Romney Marsh, they can march through the marsh and get there before um, it's actually able, been able to uh, the flood. And so the solution they're going to do is come up with this Royal Military Canal. It's 19 miles long, uh, 60 feet uh, across the top, about nine feet deep, and they take all the spoil from digging the, towel, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, canal and put it on the one side as spoil um, so they can then use that as a, a, a defensive rampart. And it effectively turns Romney Marsh uh, into an island that could be defended. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the French threat after uh, Trafalgar. Um, I had mentioned that they get down to 35 ships after they have lost their fleet. Napoleon's uh, at this portion of time is controlling most of Europe uh, Italian shipyards, uh, French shipyards, the uh, Dutch shipyards, and it's going to start them rebuilding. Um, within six years of uh, Trafalgar, by 1811, their French Navy will be up to 80 uh, ships of the line, with another 35 uh, ships of the line uh, in, uh, being built. Uh, that compared to the Fran uh, British by that time, are about at 102. Um, the other thing he's going to do is maintain um, He's going to keep maintaining frigates uh, going out constantly to harass the British. Uh, he figures if I can't b uh, beat them one-on-one, uh, -on -one, I can economically harm them. And he calculates that if for every four, uh, every ship of his that he has, it takes four British ships to keep them under blockade. So by constantly running out um, these, uh, these frigates, he's constantly wor wearing out harassing the British fleet. The other aspect is he keeps his squadrons ready to sail at a moment's notice. He keeps them uh, fully supplied, victualed. Um, he doesn't want them to sail. He doesn't want them to be picked off uh, piecemeal. But at the same time, when he is ready for them to sail, he doesn't want all the conditions of getting them ready, uh, all the supplies being sent to him to give, um, to give the British any sort of advantage. So he keeps them ready to sail at any uh, time period. Plus, he keeps large numbers of troops at his various ports, ready to go um, at, any, uh, uh, at a moment's notice. Um, when I mentioned about this idea of moment's notice and this idea that the Br French could get control of the English Channel, it's not a far-fetched idea. During the American Revolution, the French, will, French and Spanish fleet will control the English Channel for six weeks in 1789. Or 1779. So in August and September, um, the French and uh, Spanish combined fleet will go there, control the Channel, the only thing that saves Britain from an invasion is that the French army isn't ready yet. It's still training, uh, and it's not up on the, uh, the channel ready to cross. Um, then later, during the, uh, the French Revolutionary Wars, in 1796, a French fleet with 15,000 soldiers will leave uh, in the wintertime and make its way to Ireland. Um, the weather is too bad for them to be able to land. Many of the ships will run aground, uh, will disperse the fleet. They'll limp back to port. But the entire time these 15,000 soldiers and these ships are out, they're never interfered with by the Royal Navy. 
um, the Royal Navy has been pushed into the, uh, the ports because of the storm, um, and uh, they never find them. And then in 1797, there'll be 2,000 French soldiers landed on Ireland as part of the, uh, the Irish Rebellion uh, to help uh, assist the Irish Rebellion. They will not be interfered with uh, by the, uh, uh, the Royal Navy. So this idea that Napoleon and the French can get local superiority and get troops across is not that um, the outlandish. Where they're going to go is the other piece. Um, French shipping, Sardinia, uh, Sicily, uh, going back to Egypt, all these places, uh, I'll make the British continue to uh, keep reinforcements there and keep the focus on them. Napoleon also, with the military threat, is going to go with an economic threat. And this is what's known as the Continental System. After the defeat of Prussia um, in Berlin uh, in 1806, he will uh, de make the Berlin Decree, which basically blockades or embargoes all British goods from coming into uh, to Europe. That's going to be responded um, by the Brits uh, with what's known as the Orders in Council, which basically blockades all of Europe uh, to prevent any kind of, uh, of other goods coming into it. And you see this, this going backwards uh, or going back and forth between the two sides, preventing uh, shipping coming across. Huge disruption in the, uh, the normal commerce. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the rates of, of what it does to just normal cost, wheat prices in France go up by 57, or excuse me, wheat prices in England go up by 57%. Um, coffee prices in Netherlands go up by 190%. Uh, and so the disruption of, of normal commerce, exports and imports, are, uh, are very important uh, in here. We, being the U.S., also get caught up in this. Uh, being the neutral uh, shippers, uh, the Chesapeake uh, uh, incident in 1807, where uh, British ships, uh, the Leopard seizes the Chesapeake just outside of uh, Baltimore, searches it for uh, British seamen, uh, almost leads us to war in 1807. Uh, we then embargo all foreign trade, which of course works out terribly. Uh, it was very, very hard to uh, enforce. We then do the Non-Intercourse Act, saying we're not going to trade with either France or England. Um, and then when we have the Macon Bill, we'll said we'll trade with, with whichever one of them starts to limit uh, or lessen their, uh, the, the embargo on us. It sets up some really fascinating, um, Fascinating pieces. There's a huge smuggling, smuggling piece that will go on throughout uh, uh, Europe, uh, trade between England. But also th see things like the Duke of Wellington's army um, in um, our, uh, Portugal and Spain, who's relying upon U.S. ships that are importing wheat um, uh, to feed his troops. And even though they're at war after 1812, uh, Wellington will continue to allow U.S. ships with wheat to come in uh, you also see U.S. Uh, privateers capturing British supply ships or, or transports uh, with infantry and cavalry heading for the peninsula, and we'll let them come into the peninsula as opposed to trying to take them uh, back to a prize port and, and uh, dealing with them there. So it's such a hard thing to, inter uh, to interfere with. Uh, 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 Emperor Napoleon will write to his brother, who at this time is the uh, uh, Louis, who's the king of uh, the Netherlands, he says, if you need to sell your gin, the English need to buy it. Settle the points where the English smugglers are to come and fetch it, and then make them pay in money, but never in commodities. So this, this, this nink, uh, wink and a nod that this trade is going on um, is constantly uh, going back and forth in there. That's kind of undermining the system, but at the same time, it's showing just how desperate uh, this is. Um, John, or uh, uh, Fisher, um, who is the... Uh, the First Lord of the Admiralty in the early part of the 20th century once said that the army is like a projectile fired by the Navy. And as all these threats are going on, the uh, British Army is kept uh, with expeditions ready to go at a, no a moment's notice. And you can see they're constantly trying to figure out how they can strike back and how they can pull a British forces um, into uh, to Europe to be able to try to affect uh, what's going on. It leads to a number of huge disasters. Um, you look at the uh, campaign in northern uh, Germany. This is an expedition that's landed there in January 1806, just after the Battle of Austerlitz. Napoleon in Austerlitz defeats the Austrian and Russian army, makes them, uh, or the Austrian sue for peace, 
Um, and then the British come ashore with an expedition and find that the, ex the, the coalition they wanted to uh, work with is gone. Um, they're going to send the troops to, uh, to Portugal. Uh, it'll lead to the Convention of Sintra, which allow, uh, has three officers who are going to recall, include Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, to, to uh, be here court-martial. Also had the retreat and evacuation of Coruña. Um, this is every bit as epic a disaster as Dunkirk is. Um, for the 19th century uh, out of Spain. And then the Walshuren expedition, another expedition where they try to go into the Low Countries and uh, an absolute disaster that'll affect the troops that go there with, uh, with primarily they get a lot of uh, mosquito-borne uh, diseases that'll affect them throughout uh, the rest of their, their use. So let's talk a little bit about the home front and the challenges uh, that are going on there. Because of this economic um, uh, dislocation with the commerce, also because of the cost that uh, is being borne by maintaining such a large navy and maintaining a, uh, an army, uh, taxes constantly have to go up. And uh, you will see that the, the, the taxes, um, then the food prices that rise very, very highly, um, and then the economic desolation of just these new money or uh, labor-saving machines are going to cause the problems um, in England. Um, the Luddite movement is probably the most famous. Um, and uh, that's a painting or a picture of King Lud. It's a man with a beard dressed in a woman's dress. There is no King Lud. Um, there is no actual um, leader of this Luddite movement. Uh, but the Luddites, um, and if you've been called Luddites because you're anti-technology, um, these the, they don't like looms. They don't like any of these new modern uh, uh, labor savings. So starting in 1811, and for about the next four years, these mobs will come. Uh, go into factories at night and break uh, these machines that are threatening their jobs. Uh, it gets to be so bad that about 18,000 British soldiers will be deployed uh, trying to put down these riots and catch the Luddites. Um, 1812, 1813, if you're a factory owner uh, and as you're having uh, repair work done, many of them are putting panic rooms into their factories. So if it could get broken into in the night and they're there, they can uh, escape back into it. But again, these, these, this, this changes of what's going on that's starting with the industrialization of England uh, plays a huge role. And the other aspect also is uh, the madness of King George. Um, he either had a blood disease or uh, a mental uh, uh, instability. Uh, the first crisis comes in 1788-89. It leads to about a four-month period where they're trying to think if his son will be appointed as the regent. He'll just regain... Uh, his senses just as uh, they're getting ready to pass the law. Um, they'll have two other smaller bouts uh, in 1801 and 1804. Uh, but in 1810, becomes, uh, his uh, favorite daughter dies, and at that point he descends into uh, insanity. Um, and his son, the Prince of Wales, will be uh, named the Prince Regent. Um, all of this and this changing of the political direction uh, of England has been very, very disruptive of, again, of what that fight is and how they're trying to go after uh, Napoleon um, and uh, France. Ironically, when the Prince of Wales becomes the King Regent and all the very much uh, more liberal uh, people that have uh, kind of circled around him expect him to be much more, uh, I guess, uh, liberal in their, his views, he ends up being more conservative in what many of his things and, and, and annoys a lot of those supporters uh, that he has. So let me talk a little bit about, or just to conclude, <coughs> excuse me. Um, hopefully as you look at this, that uh, England um, is that one piece, that one threat that Napoleon really can't ever get to. As he consistently um, uh, has consolidated in Europe, he's not been able to figure out a way to get across the channel. However, this is not, um, uh, it, it's not impossible to do. It doesn't end in 1805. Um, but it is always, he's always searching for other ways to get back to him. This is what's going to lead him into Portugal. Uh, it'll lead him into Spain, uh, and it'll lead him into Russia. Um, and these are some of the biggest mistakes uh, he makes uh, that'll take out some of his power. Um, hopefully, um, you kind of see uh, that this fight is not necessarily Napoleon's being a, 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 a despot. But this is power politics, uh, 18th century uh, style. 
And the fight against it is only looks back and looks clear when you look at it from a, a post-Waterloo uh, type of, a, of a position. So if I have any questions now. Get away from the microphone. I was going to thank you. Yes, sir. Um, about the crossing of the English Channel, did I read once that Napoleon had a very like superstitious or paranoid, like a supernatural thing was going to uh, beat him if he were to cross the English Channel? Was that not true? Is that I really can't answer. I'm not familiar with it enough to be able to 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 know. Um, so I, I'm not. Yeah, sorry. Tom? Uh, was there, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, Pitt and a little bit about uh, Fox and about uh, England's uh, uh, shifting uh, positions with respect to Napoleon. Uh, I wondered uh, whether if in Britain at this time there was some uh, theorist who were, was uh, consistently aware of the French uh, threat and, uh, and uh, created a kind of a master strategy of how to address it and uh, a kind of vision of how big a threat this really was. When you say a master strategist, I'm not really sure. Um, I mean, when you talk about British um, military strategy, one of the aspects that uh, is going to uh, disrupt in the middle, and I didn't get into it, was the selling of commissions. Uh, the Duke of York, uh, who was a very competent uh, commander in chief, um, uh, his mistress um, is using her position as his mistress to sell commissions, and uh, supposedly. Uh, some of the rumors are that uh, won't have sex with him unless he agrees to the commissions that she wants, uh, which will lead to him being taken out as the commander-in-chief and Lord Dundas. Um, from a British Army perspective, um, Britain has always constantly wanted to play a role in England without a big army, but with the, with the help of uh, other large armies, Austria, uh, Fran uh, well, France in the 70s or earlier, but... Uh, 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 Prussia, it's looking for that type of attempt. And these small armies that they're, these expeditions are always looking at where they can put their foot in and then use their economic might and uh, subsidies to try to allow uh, bigger armies uh, to, to stay in there. I didn't get into the British subsidies, uh, which are a huge role uh, in keeping these coalitions together because uh, Britain's paying millions of pounds um, to these various countries to keep troops in the field. Um, and it's one of the huge uh, challenges that they have of, of being able to figure out how much we can buy, how much we can uh, support. Um, England uh, is going to keep Wellington's army in the peninsula, but for most of it, they think it's really, it, 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 it's a huge political fight because it's too far away. They want to be in northern Germany. Um, the Hanovers, uh, House of Hanover is there. Um, they'll take troops out of the peninsula in 1813 to put into northern Germany. And so... They're there because it's the only place they can get back in Napoleon, but they really want to be um, cooperating with the big armies uh, up in northern Europe. So I'm not sure if that answers your question exactly, but. You know, I, that's an interesting question. When you say a theorist, I, I don't know uh, of one. I mean, British prime ministers are wrestling with these type of, uh, uh, of issues. Um, there are some, because of the cost, are trying to go for peace after 1806. Uh, there's another attempt uh, to make peace. Uh, Spencer Percival in 1812 is the only British prime minister to be assassinated. And part of it is uh, he's assassinated by a man who has economic problems and uh, will cause a crisis. It's one of the, um, you take a look at the newspapers in the summer of 1812 after Spencer Percival's uh, assassinated in May. They have a hard time for, uh, forming a new government, and it's just at the time that uh, President Madison's ultimatum to Britain is running out. And the papers are screaming that we have to, uh, we being Britain, have to get a prime minister so we can do something about this. We don't want to be fighting another, uh, another country. And of course, they don't get a prime minister in time, and the, and the uh, ultimatum runs out. So, I think there's a question up here, Alex. Yes, uh, what was the uh, British view of the uh, uh, Napoleon selling uh, Louisiana to the U.S.? Uh, what, were they aware that that was coming? Uh, did they try to block it? Were they concerned about what would happen to the U.S.? 
uh, once it acquired all that extra territory? Yeah, I mean, it, it occurs during the, the, the 14 months of peace, um, and it, most people think it is Napoleon unloading something that he's going to lose once the war starts again. Um, I don't know, uh, I really haven't read much about what the British views about this are. I know, do know that it was surprised the American negotiators. I mean, we go just to get access to New Orleans and buy New Orleans, and he offers up all the Louisiana Purchase. So it doesn't seem it's like it's something that has been well advertised and thought out. Um, so, yeah, it's good. I can add a little bit to that. The, uh, the British view was that it was not a clean sale between Spain and France, and therefore uh, this justified their uh, attack on New Orleans later on, mm -hmm. that they would then grab New Orleans and give it back to Spain, <laughs> uh, thus completely blocking up any traffic up and down the Mississippi by the United States. So they, they cried foul mm -hmm. almost immediately, it just wasn't a clean sale. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mark, I, I was not aware of the substantial uh, buildup, amphibious buildup that Napoleon was mm -hmm. contemplating to you know, make a mm -hmm. leap across the pond there. Uh, to what extent were lessons learned codified mm -hmm. from that, to your knowledge? <laughs> codified, uh, you know where I'm going. Uh, and uh, at some point in time, perhaps picked up on by the Germans in terms of mm -hmm. preparation for sea lion, if at all. Yeah, I, our marine in the room, uh, uh, of course, focuses, focuses right on the amphibious uh, pieces. I don't know if, if any of that gets to codified uh, at any um, sense the, uh, of the way we would look at it today. And it, part of it is how, what doctrine is uh, at that time. Um, this idea of doctrine that we have of a military way of operating and a preconceived notions is really not, it's more drill at the time period. and so these best practices he's doing. He will do after, in, between 1803 and 1805 and 6, he's making these barges that are basically road barges. They're going to carry several hundred men across, um, uh, across the channel. Um, after Trafalgar, when he starts the new rebuilding program, he starts building what's called flutes. These are warship or ships that are designed as transports. And so a, a crew of about 100 men can uh, transport 300 soldiers uh, on board, um, and so it's it's a much more efficient way of doing it, uh, and for longer distances. Uh, the the channel barges are relatively short distance across the channel, and not good for throwing an expeditionary force. But whether there's any kind of lessons learned from that and then codified, I'm really not familiar. Is that it? How serious is, did they, how much did they think it was really going to happen? Um, they think it was going to happen. And, and uh, George III uh, in 1803 is actually out there, uh, uh, he's inspecting some of the volunteers, about 20, 25,000 volunteers. They have 50,000 people show up uh, to watch this. And he's going to write, um, we are here in daily expectation that Bonaparte will attempt his threatened invasion. Should his troops effect a landing, I shall certainly put myself at the head of mine and my other armed subjects to repel him. Um, there's also a naval um, commentator, um, I can't remember what his name is, but he, um, he says in January 1806, after the defeat of Austria uh, in Russia at, at Austerlitz, he thinks that um, this now heightens the threat of an invasion again, is that Napoleon now has cleared up to Central Europe, he can march back and, and try to try that, despite the fact that Trafalgar had just happened uh, four months earlier. So that first piece, when you look at the building activity they're going to do, I mean, they're going to build the Martello Towers relatively quickly, two to three years uh, to do that, the Romney March, um, the, the amount of troops they just put under arms. Uh, it's a serious threat. Uh, there is a, a, a real fear, um, and part of it is because Great Britain has such a fear of a standing army um, that it doesn't have a big standing army. It doesn't have a lot of field fortifications. Um, there were some pieces they were looking at the defense of uh, London, that if Napoleon gets to London, how are we going to defend it? And what the army does is they, they basically are going to do field fortifications. That's what they can do. And so they basically go out and survey the land, and they put all the materials they need to do, the wood and, and stuff, pre there, but they don't 
start digging. So that way the farmers continue to use it. They don't have to pay the farmers for the use of it. But when you think of a large area like London, they say it's going to take 180,000 troops to defend it. Uh, and of course the field, the permanent fortification is the Tower of London in the middle of the city. So it's not really that of effective um, fortification. So um, they haven't had the threat to build all these frontier type things like other European countries have. And so they just, um, when the threat is, if, they, if Napoleon can get ashore, it's, it's not going to be held up by fortifications. It's going to be a battle um, in the field. And they have not done well in the uh, revolutionary wars, particularly in the, uh, uh, the, the Flanders campaign. And so that's a real, real concern and a real, uh, probably a valid concern also. Um, you talking about the, the Martello Towers and stuff? Um, I don't think you can rate the militia and the, uh, and the question was about if, um, that Napoleon himself probably would not have crossed. He probably would have sent one of his marshals like Messina across uh, with four corps. Um, and how would that come? The, the Martello Towers are designed to defend at the beaches. Uh, and I've seen, uh, there's a fantastic book, um, uh, Britain at Bay, that talks about these defenses. Um, which has some kind of extraordinary numbers in it. Um, the 24-pound cannons are these big naval guns. Uh, the best trained uh, fleet in England can do three broadsides in a minute and a half. So they can fire it three times. But this author will make the claim that these Martello Tower guns can fire 10 to 12 times in a minute and will do then do the calculations for the amount of lead that it can uh, uh, send. Probably uh, extraordinarily uh, risky. Uh, the volunteer troops probably have a very, very low, um, uh, very, very low combat effectiveness. Um, the army itself, not bad, but it's only about 50,000 uh, in there. And the militia forces are probably the biggest uh, question. Um, they're by ballot, um, so you're basically drafting people from those local, local counties. The officers are uh, from well-respected county um, families, so they don't necessarily have uh, a military connection. However, if you are an officer who has gone on half pay, gone off back, you have probably volunteered then to be back in there. So they possibly could have some um, uh, value uh, to you, but it would be very, very questionable. Particularly when you talk about the Grand Army of 1805. Um, Napoleon's army has been along the channel for two years, and they're in the six camps, and they actually have a, a day-to-day -day training type of cycle that they were doing uh, where they'll have regimental drill, then they'll have uh, brigade drill, then they'll have division drill, then they'll have core exercise, then they have a day off and they start it all over again. And they've been doing this for two years. These are uh, about a third of those soldiers are veterans and the other two-thirds are new volunteers. Um, and uh, they're extraordinarily well trained uh, and disciplined. Going against a force, a British volunteer force, that would be very, very uneven. Uh, so. I would have to give the French the, the, the nod in that particular piece. I'm sure there's a lot of British historians who would disagree with me there. Did Napoleon's Navy have an amphibious doctrine uh, and also did they have, uh, let's say, purpose uh, preparations to carry the doctrine out? I'm not so sure about the, the amphibious doctrine. As we talked about that, this idea that there's a, um, a codified, written down way of doing things is probably, uh, for the early 19th century, too, uh, too far to go. Um, there's always, the Br French Navy always has a real um, uh, problem with experience compared to the British Navy. Um, Britain has been able to clear the high seas of French shipping for the most part. What they can never stop is the coastal trade. Um, and so what France has set up is a series of cor uh, uh, forts along the coast protecting the ports, semaphores, so they re can report where the British fleet is when they see them. Um, and yet there's a thriving coastal trade that basically goes from port to port moving uh, supplies along. What that allows them to do is continue to train seamen. And so you're getting experienced seamen um, from, uh, from this type of piece. But it, there is, you still have to transition that into a naval uh, type of experience. Um, yeah, I don't, 
I can't answer well enough to, to or, or give you the thing where there is an actually written doctrine uh, to be able to say that they're, they're learning upon that. I mean, when you talk about amphibious landings at this time, this is a very, very, um, it's not the well-orchestrated movement that you would see in, in the modern time period. Uh, sailors are uh, rowing boats to shore with soldiers on board. The soldiers jump out. Uh, and then the boats row back in there. Uh, Calfrey uh, and, for, and artillery are particularly hard to land. Uh, they have one technique where they'll take two of the whaling boats and they put like a, uh, boards across them and then they will lower the horse onto that and then row the horse in, uh, which is dangerous because the horse may not like it. Well, most of the time what they will do uh, is they'll just lower the horse into the water and let the horse swim ashore. Um, but when you're doing this, there, there's, a, there's a huge piece of, of uh, a critical time of real danger in your landing before you can get inland enough and get organized. Um, and once you get there and get all that stuff on bo board, um, but it's not uh, any sort of, uh, if you think of a uh, marine landing in the Pacific in World War II or something like that, it's not anything of that kind of sense. It's usually you go somewhere where the enemy's not and then move your expeditionary force to shore. So. I would just add to that, I, I think, um like you said, it's not, the notion of it a contested landing pretty much doesn't exist. You're not trying to attack fortifications, you're not trying to attack especially gunfire, because you've got shore batteries, you've got mortars, they're going to destroy any landing force. So like you said, it's not, there's not this kind of Omaha Beach idea um, where you've got LSTs rolling onto the beach and Amtraks and all that. It's just, they, they wouldn't even think that way, much less have what we call a doctrine for it. Now, do you think uh, Napoleon, uh, as he looked across the channel, which is uh, quite wide there, maybe we're going to have to talk, what, 20 miles at, at, at least, mm -hmm. uh, is, it, is his hesitation or concern influenced at all by uh, his understanding of how uh, difficult river crossings were? And, of course, a river crossing you know, would be a much shorter distance than what he faced with the channel. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's river crossing that's it's causing him the, the thing, or just the fact that the British fleet, until the British fleet is taken out of it, the danger um, for his army, because it's going to take three days, six tides, to get across. And unless he can control the channel for that period of time, um, a single arm ship in the middle of that fleet would, would just absolutely cause devastation. So you have to drive off uh, that British fleet. I don't think the, the challenges of a river crossing, which are absolutely, like you said, uh, uh, significant challenges, I don't think that's weighing as much as the control of the channel. Um, you know. No other questions? Okay, I just, I do have a slide up here for next, next month. Mark Cole, who's back there, you can all uh, pick on. We'll be talking about the German home front in World War II. Okay, thank you.